Do we make our worship experiences so flashy that it promotes a bait and switch to get people in the door? Do we try to be really cool and just sprinkle a little bit of the gospel in our churches? Is the power of teaching God's word enough to compel people to follow him? We're hearing from a former Muslim turned Christian church planter today on Making Sunday Happen. Let's do it. This is the definitive podcast for helping you plan, create, and execute dynamic worship experiences at your church. Useful, practical content in the areas of production, worship, communications, first impressions, and more. This is Making Sunday Happen. Hey guys, welcome to Making Sunday Happen, the definitive podcast for those who plan, create, and execute worship experiences at churches all over the world. On today's show, I welcome Adam Mutalsib. You're going to love this guy. He's a former Muslim. He is now a church planter in Baltimore, Maryland. We're going to talk about how the American church can be flash, show, lights, camera, entertainment at times, and how we need to rely on God's Word and the Holy Spirit to transform, that God's Word is enough, that preaching God's Word is where the power is. Uh, and you're getting this from a guy who owns a media company, okay? So, uh, And we help you kind of elevate your worship experience. We're going to talk about that a little bit with Adam today about how it's interesting that we're having this conversation because even though we can help you make Sunday happen, we can help you elevate and raise your game when it comes to executing your Sunday morning worship experience, we don't want to take away from uh, that God's Word is where the power is at. It's not in your your greatest and latest gear, uh, you know, your new lighting, your new sound system, what fader you're, uh, you're moving, what button you're pushing, that sort of thing. Uh, the power on Sunday morning for life change comes from the Holy Spirit and from God's Word, and God's Word is enough, and God's Word is powerful. Uh, So today you're going to hear powerful insight from a former Muslim coming from the Islamic church and the power of Christ in his life. Incredible story and great message for church planners and pastors and all of us today. So we'll dive right in with Adam right after this. Hey guys, I wanted to tell you about my friends at Messenger AVL. They are a full service design builder and systems integrator for sound reinforcement, theatrical lighting, multimedia projection, video production and broadcast, and digital signage. We've used an LED wall from Messenger AVL at some of the conferences that we've been at. Absolutely stunning and amazing. They specialize in church, house of worship, and educational markets. They offer seamless and transparent technology systems that can assist you in achieving your goals, your vision, and your purpose. Working closely with architects, general contractors, and designers, they design comprehensive technology systems that work flawlessly across platforms to offer exceptional value, performance, practicality, and ease of use. I can't recommend them highly enough. Check out my friends at Messenger AVL at messengeravl.com. That's messengeravl.com. Hey guys, today I welcome Adam Mutasib. Adam is the founding pastor of Redemption City Church in Baltimore, Maryland. Adam, I tried really hard not to butcher your last name, but you know, I'm trying here, buddy. Did I come close? (laughs) You did not, but all is grace. (laughs) I'm sorry, buddy. I should have just said, here's Adam. That's what I should have just said. (laughs) That's what people tend to do (laughs) with my name. Well, man, thanks so much for hanging out. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, you're a former Muslim turned Christian, right? That's correct. Yep. Awesome. Tell me about a little bit about your journey. Sure. Uh, my dad's from Palestine, immigrated to the U.S. when he was in his 20s, met my mom, got married. They got divorced when I was two. I mm. grew up, when I was with my dad, following the five pillars of Islam, going to the mosque on Fridays, mm. working my way to heaven. And then uh, my mom started dating a guy who was going to a church. They brought me with them one time. I heard the gospel. It's actually the story of Zacchaeus, the wee little man. You were and up I in a tree? Like, yeah, I was not, but I oh, was okay. compelled by the story. I, you know, I think every kid can identify with Zacchaeus. Man, yeah. neglected, forgotten, unwanted in some ways. And 
uh, yeah, the gospel just wrecked me. And then someone gave me the Jesus film. My mom and I watched it together and prayed the prayer at the end when I was about 10 or 11 years old. Wow. So a uh, pretty radical shift. And my dad left after that and we didn't have a relationship for a long time. So that's a brief version of my transition from Islam to Christianity. Awesome. So wh- when did you plant Redemption City? March of 2018 is when we launched. <laughs> so about four and a half years ago. We began meeting in a living room about this time in 2017. So we've been okay. working five years, launched four and a half. How did the pandemic affect you guys? Did y'all stop and, and restart or kept, kept meeting? How did it affect you guys? We basically became a live stream, you know, yeah. like you can't, yeah. you can't meet anywhere. So we just filmed our services and uh, it actually, so the pandemic kind of created a new church for a lot of churches and even did it for us. You know, we were about 150 maybe people before the pandemic. And mm-hmm. then after the pandemic, we had a lot of different people. We were able to buy a building at a really low cost because of the real estate impact. And we grew a ton. That's awesome. So, in a weird way, COVID was the best thing that ever happened to our church. Awesome, man. That's cool. So how did God move in you to from a former Muslim to to planning a church? What was the call of the church plan? How well, did that come to you? It, it's not anything complicated. I, I just read Acts, man. And you just read the book of Acts and you're like, what are they doing all the time? They're planting churches. It's like the story of Acts. And I just, you know, I got to a place in my faith where I like, I, I actually want to do the Bible. Whatever it says, I want to do it. And mm. I see a lot of church planning and evangelism mm. in the Bible. So I just figured Christians plant churches. That's just what makes sense when you read the Bible. So um, when I was like 21 years old, I began a journey of like, I want to prepare to plant a church. And I was, I pretty much trained and developed for the next eight years. To do and that. To do that. Yeah. Got under some mentors, went to a great sending church, went to seminary, had some ministry experience, and then I planted. So tell me about what you think of today's church planning strategy. Is it, is it, do you see something different in, from a biblical perspective, or how do you see how most churches are planted? Well, I think a lot of folks planning a church, or when they think of planning a church, they think they're starting a service. Like, let's, let's put a lot of people in a room, have a killer message, some good music, and get as many people sitting down as possible and coming back. But I, I'm not sure that's the most effective way to see a church. I think a church, if you look at the scriptures, is a family of people committed to each other and committed to the scriptures and to Jesus. And uh, they're trying to reach their city with the gospel. And so when I began planning a church, I was really committed to not have a, you know a lot of flash and sizzle. I really just wanted us to open up the Bible, preach it, recite a creed, take communion, and share this good news of a savior who died and lived for us with our neighbors. And um, I think I've been surprised planning in a post-Christian secular city like Baltimore, how effective the gospel is and just preaching verse by verse to the Bible is. Hmm. You can be surprised. Lost people don't mind hearing the Bible talk and uh, they're interested even, especially if you make it engaging. So long story short, Um, I would encourage guys planting a church or looking at church plant, go to a place that was substance, preach the Bible, preach the gospel, and uh, watch what God does. Do you feel like kind of today's model is a little bit bait and switch? Like be be really cool, drip the gospel a little bit. Um, Do you feel that? Oh, yeah, 100%. Uh, I think, so I, I grew up in a Muslim background, right? And going to the mosque on Fridays, there is no bait and switch. It's like you get there, you take your shoes off and you pray for 30 minutes. And then, then they read the Quran and there's no music. They don't, they don't, you know, there's right. no Hillsong United Muslim right. edition. There, there's definitely no smoke <laughs> machines. Right. No mood lighting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The best thing, the most <clears throat> fancy thing you got is a meal and it's usually pretty good food. You know, yeah. it's so, so far away from like seeker driven, but yeah. yet Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. Why is, is that, that true? Fast world's fastest growing religion. Yeah, Google it. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy, man. And I, uh, I think just my thought are if if the Quran and a workspace got a message works for Islam, why do we not believe that the Bible and a grace based message of a finished uh, work through our Savior won't work? I I, I think it yeah. will. So, so how can we take a page, for lack of a better 
uh, question. Uh, how can we take, how can Christians take a page from the Islamic church in that sense? How can we win people to faith through our message as opposed to our flash? Oh man, that's a, a wonderful question. Um, I think prayer, obviously like, uh, Muslims pray a lot five times a day for like 15 minutes. And I would argue that the Christian view of God is even more familial, fatherly, so, and even perhaps even more dependent, uh, especially if you're Reformed. So, praying, starting with that. Secondly, I, I think, again, just relying on the, the gospel and the Bible, like preaching verse by verse through the Bible, not thinking what's going to gather a bunch of room, a bunch of people in a room, be thinking like what's going to fill people's hearts what do they need to hear? I mean, God wrote a book. He wrote a book. So maybe just teach that in a way that's right. understandable for lost people. That's right. I, and I think, go really, ahead. I'm sorry. I, mean, I just think, you know, I think we should be creative. We should be outside the box. We should be innovative, but I don't think Tim Tebow needs to come and speak for our church. You know, I don't think <laughs> he's great. Right. I don't think we need him. I don't think we need iPad giveaways. I don't think we need um, Hillsong United quality music. Those are good things, but right. We don't need it. So I got it uh, probably in trouble on Facebook the other day when I was, I, in fact, I ended up taking it down, but, but I'll tell you what it says just between me and you and our entire audience <laughs> uh, it, it is um, that I think sometimes people can be, uh, uh, some pastors can, can say a quick snippet on social media or have a sound bite from the stage um, that is trying to sound cool or trying to sound really sound bitey. Oh, this is going to get their attention. This is going to be it. This is going to be the thing that, but, but it almost twists, either twists scripture a little bit, or like, it's not the full story or just this kind of a titillating sound bite. Yeah. Do you feel that, that like, that yeah. like guys are more after the sound bite than just preaching the word? And I'm not, I'm generalizing here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but so when I, when I say preach the Bible, I mean, preach the meaning, the intent author's intended meaning of the text. You can use the Bible as a, as a diving board, as a launching point to say what you already want to say, or you can use it as a swimming pool, the place where you're just going in and out, just trying to really get what God is saying to the people you're speaking to. So, and I think in a lot of churches and church plants, in our desire, a good desire to reach and engage lost people, we, we do TED Talks with a little sprinkle of, of gospel. But I think... I mean, there are a lot of great TED Talks. People need the Word of God, and they need the finished work of Jesus and what it means for me when I'm single and wanting a husband, or when I my career is in shambles, or when I'm lonely. Show me how the finished work of Jesus gives me hope and joy and peace. That is what captivates people's hearts and gets lost people coming, and their lives changed. So Not he did he, for financial freedom, which is a good thing. But anyway, right. Right. So he did it for you. So you went from let's let's dive back into your testimony for a second. It went really from, uh, you know, I Islam was, you tell me, more choke of, uh, you know, choked you and more do do do, and Jesus was more. It's already done. Like tell tell me more of your your story. Sure. I mean, Islam is completely. It's it's a scale of of good and bad, right? So if you do good you get spiritual points. And when you do bad, you get spiritual, spiritual negatives and you're basically competing with everyone else to be holier than them. So Allah will hopefully let you into heaven. So even if I don't want to pray, I have to, because I need to be good enough for Allah to love me. Um, I have to fast I, during Ramadan. I have to give alms to the poor. I have to visit Mecca. I have to be a good person or else. And then I, God forbid, I can, I confess my sin because then that just shows that I'm not worthy of, of his love. And right. it's just so much, it's, it's older brother and the prodigal son uh, story. It's, it's constant having to prove yourself. And in the gospel, I mean, it's, it's, we don't have to do anything. Jesus did it all. And now we get to pray. We don't have to, I, but I want to, I want to pray because I get to talk to him. Uh, I get to be on mission, not because I have to, but because I want to join him in what he's doing in the world. It's a revolutionary message that really does actually produce life change. Good. Uh, so with, with the church and talking about the American church, relate me to 
being creative? Is it okay to be creative? Is it okay to use props? Is is it okay to, you know, uh, use sermon illustrations or whatever the case may be? Kind of get me into this. Is it entertainment or is it gospel? How do the two work together? Yeah, I think the barometer of that question is what do people leave thinking about? If they leave thinking about the camel that was on stage rather than Jesus in the manger, then that illustration might be a little too much, you know? So what, what is drawing people and keeping people is the question you need to ask. And if they walk away, Charles Spurgeon has a great quote. He was like, I don't want people leaving saying what a great sermon. I want them leaving saying what a great savior. So when people leave your church plan or your service or the church you're a part of, are you saying, man, Jesus is incredible. Or are you saying, man, my church is so cool. All right. What market research have church planners relied on in the past? What have they in the past catered to? Well, I think you just look at what what are young people, what are lost people doing in the world? What do they like? And then how can we do that in the church to draw them? We, um, we, we kind of, I mean, it's tempting in the the church planning world. You think success is people coming to a gathering or service. And so what do I need to do to get people to come to that service? Um, but I would argue that people don't know what they need most. So if you just focus on doing what the world does and, and winning people with what the world does, I think you're going to be dissatisfied with what is produced over the years. But if so, you start, Go ahead. If numbers equal souls, we know that, you know, it's scriptural that they grew in number. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so tell me how numbers relate to how do you measure numbers or do you, measure more spiritual growth or both? Definitely measure numbers. I mean, numbers are all throughout the book of Acts. There's a, there's a, uh, I can think Acts chapter two, there's 2000 people that got saved. And then you see that on and on and on. They count. There's a book of the Bible called numbers. So we're not against numbers. We're just, I don't think numbers drove Jesus. I think a lot of his numbers were pretty impressive for a while. Like think about Jesus' strategy. Hey, Jesus, you want to reach the whole world with the gospel? What are you going to do? Run out the Coliseum and preach an amazing sermon and bring in, the best uh, musicians and uh, first time guest gifts. And no, I'm going to spend time with 12 guys. We're going to sit and have dinner and they're going to walk with me while I heal a leper. Hey, come check out um, this woman at the well with me. Let's talk to her like that. It's more, I think it's less flashy. Church planning should be not super flashy and impressive, especially the first couple of years. Hmm. It should be like, Hey, here's the gospel. Hey, here's what the Bible says. Let's do this together. So why why does the the gospel capture the heart? The gospel captures the heart because in the same way, when a little kid is playing on the playground and looks back at his dad smiling and he knows he's safe, and he, he knows he's in love no matter what, and he feels the confidence to jump back into the playground or or run into the classroom because he knows his dad loves him. You know, just that feeling of safety and comfort, knowing that no matter what I do, Jesus has already covered my sin and there's nothing I need to do to make him love me. I'm already loved. And his love for me just overflows and it will never end. And he can never, I can never be plucked out of his hand. I mean, these, these truths change your heart when you know you are adored by God. Hmm. And, and the reason that, for at least for me, Islam wasn't that is because you don't have that kind of love. You have to earn it. You need to prove yourself. And hopefully he loves you enough. Have you had any family tension with any extended family that are maybe still Muslim? Or how has that gone? Yeah. Um, when I was about 10 or 11 and I prayed the prayer to receive Christ, my dad uh, said I was a bad son. And he left, he, he moved to Jordan and I didn't see him for about 10 years. And when he came back, he said, I was a, I was a bad son again. Hmm. So my relationship with Jesus literally cost me my dad, hmm. but I got another father in heaven and it was, it was a worthwhile trait. I might, I've forgiven my dad and we reconciled, but I mean, when, when you go through something like that, like me, a Muslim who leaves his faith and comes to Christianity cool songs don't do the trick iPad giveaways. I mean, the iPad gets old and I need a new one. The, 
the cool series on uh, the latest movie that came out that summer. Like, a, like those things don't really fill my soul and make up for the hole left from my dad abandoning me. You know, it does a message of a God who loved me enough to come to this earth to live the life I should have di- lived and died the death I deserved. Why are we not preaching that? Why are we not filling our people's hearts with that incredible news? That's our message. What do you say to the pastor who faithfully preaches the word, even if it doesn't tickle ears, um, and maybe struggles with comparison? Well, this church down the road is getting so much more X, Y, Z than we are, but I'm over here faithfully preaching the word. Uh, I think it's John 21. Jesus is like to Peter, you're going to die. And Peter's like, well, what about John? And Jesus says, what is that to you? What is, what is that to you? Is what Jesus would say. I, I Run your race, brother. Sure. Run your race. And um, I heard this quote from Mark Dever one time. He was like, a lot of pastors are worried they don't have enough people. And, and uh, he quoted some Puritan. And the guy was like, the Puritan was like, trust me, when you get to heaven, you'll feel like you had more than enough people because you had to give You have to give an account for each of them. Hebrew says, I believe. So uh, don't worry so much about the number of people. Worry about what you're doing with the people you have. All right, so on this podcast, we help churches make Sunday happen. We talk about ways to improve your your worship experience, ways that you can uh, improve that. So tell me why it's okay to not have all the bells and whistles on Sunday. And we This might be repetitive, but uh, I'll just ask you again. So uh, why is it not okay to not have, you know, the latest uh, video, the latest song, the latest bells and whistles in my well, worship experience? First of all, don't, don't hear me saying don't value gospel excellence. We should fight for excellence. God made mountains and bacon and leaves. <laughs> we enjoy all those things. Those are excellent. So let's be excellent back. Don't hear me saying don't have good sermons, good music. All I'm saying is, like, let's just look at the Bible and look at the strategy of Jesus. And he, he's like, he's got a huge crowd. And what does he say? Eat my body and drink my blood. And they all left. I mean, we follow that guy. Yeah. If we follow him and worship him, shouldn't we fo- like do what he did? I'm not saying you need to say that. I'm just saying like, maybe we're not doing something wrong if people leave. Maybe we're not doing something wrong if people aren't wowed by our production. Maybe we're doing the exact right thing because it's what he did. Mm. So how to, uh, to that regard, how does the gospel not only reach people, but keep them? You you mentioned that, you know, they leave for some reasons. Yeah. But how? Let's talk about the flip. How does the gospel keep people? A lot of people think the gospel is, Tim Keller says it this way, that the gospel isn't the ABCs of the Christian life. It's the A to Z. A lot of people think we just need the gospel to get saved, to get into the party. And then from there and on, it's other stuff we focus on. Mm-hmm. But the gospel is the sustaining news I need at every moment, every day. And so you're a people whether they've been Christians for one month or 25 years, they need to know the finished work of Christ and how it affects their life right now. Because we all have idols. Uh, uh, John Calvin said our hearts are idol factories. And so today my temptation is to put my value and worth in my work performance. And I need the gospel. I need to remember that even if I blow this podcast, even if the meeting I'm, I have later today and the sermon I'm prepping for the, later this week, even if all that stinks and I screw it up, that doesn't affect in any way God's love of me. My safety in the kingdom is the light in me. I need the gospel in the same way the unbeliever does. And so you serve your people best on Sundays when you remind them of the glorious news of the finished work of Jesus and what it's done, what it means for our lives. So why church planning? Why, why are you continuing to be a church planner and not something else? Church planners most effectively reach people far from God, better than any other type of ministry in the world. So if you want people to know the gospel, what I would argue church planning is the most effective way, especially in urban metropolitan cities. And so uh, 
we've had a lot of people who are unchurched, de-churched, or never churched come to Redemption City Church uh, that probably would have never stepped foot in an older church, established church. Hmm. So, and we've seen people get baptized, lost people become members, and then become missionaries. We have guys who and folks who've been saved at our church and are now going on mission with our church plans. And um, so that's why I do it. Awesome. All right. I'm going to hit you with some rapid fire before we go. Right. Okay, here we go. Why do most church plants fail? Ephesians 4 it says um, the job of the pastor, the church leader is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. I think a lot of church planters try and do everything right away. They're the greeting team. They're the worship team. They're the preacher. They're the shepherd. They're the counselor. Uh, so equip other leaders to do most of the work in the church and only do what you can do. What is something else that you took from the Islamic church that they got right that we should implement in the Christian church? A reverence for God, a holy awe, an otherness that we can never comprehend, and a, in that bringing that into the gathering, walking in with that awe of God. What's something really encouraging that you're seeing in the church today, Big C Church? Definitely new believers or baby Christians get trained, developed, growing in their walk, and then joining the Great Commission. There is nothing cooler in the world than to have Timothys and Tituses that you've developed and sent out. Good. All right, flip side, what is something that frustrates you about what you see at churches relating to the worship experience or church planning, or what's something that frustrates you? How fickle American Christians are, how quickly they'll change another church to another mm -hmm. church based on what they're receiving or not receiving, um, that they expect to be fed rather than to contribute, that church is something you go to, not something you're a part of. It's a service and not a family. People tend to think that. So all that's frustrating. All right, last one for you. What character traits do you admire the most in church planners and ministry leaders? That is a great question. There are a lot. I really admire somebody who walks really closely with Jesus. And that's a lot of qualities. But somebody who, even when things aren't going well, they have joy. Somebody who's at peace, even in the chaos of church planning. Somebody who just emanates godliness. That is so rare. And um, I think you can be a great church planner if you have flash and, and charm and gathering ability. But the thing that really impresses me is a guy who walks closely with Jesus. Well, man, thank you for your time. Really appreciate you sharing this with me. And man, uh, blessings on Redemption City. Thank you, man. It's great talking with you and uh, grace and peace to you. Hey guys, at 1230 Media, one area that we serve churches and ministries is with custom media content. And when God called me years ago to start this ministry, he planted in me a calling to reach thousands of churches, and it's amazing to see that happen. All glory to Jesus Christ. Uh, it's amazing to watch uh, how our team uh, is being an impact and helping folks like you, churches like yourselves, ministries, uh, share the gospel using media content. We are the go-to media provider for several of the leading ministries in the nation. Folks like Outreach, Awana, Answers in Genesis, Seeds Family Worship, Grow Curriculum, the Southern Baptist Convention, the National Religious Broadcasters, and more. These ministries alone serve thousands and thousands of churches, so it is so humbling to be trusted by these folks to produce graphics and video content for the resources that they provide. We also serve dozens of churches like Starpoint Church, Crossroads Church, Mountain Park Church, Union Church, Church at the Crossing, Atlantic Shores Baptist, and many more. 
If we can help you with any custom graphics or video need that you might have at your church from sermon series design, announcement and event graphics, social media graphics, sermon bumpers, promo videos, sermon edits, or anything else, please let us know. You can contact our team today and get your project started with us at 1230.media slash custom. That's 1230.media slash custom. The show notes for this episode are available now at makingsundayhappen.com. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us this week. Next week on the show, I welcome my friend Justin Trapp. Justin is a ministry-minded entrepreneur. He's the founder of Ministry Pass and Seminary. We're going to be talking about sermon illustrations next week. We'll take a deep dive for pastors on questions like how often in my sermon do I need to put in an illustration? What types of illustrations can I use? How long should they be? That and much more next week on the show. We'll go out there and create some incredible worship experiences this weekend. I'll catch you next week. Making Sunday Happen is a production of the Ministry of 1230 Media. For show notes, archive episodes, and more free resources for your church, visit makingsundayhappen.com.